Hi, uh, GATS5083 class. This is uh, week five and video number six, Spiritual Formation in Christ and Small Groups, looking at both uh, Lillard a little bit more and Watson. And uh, you guys are doing great in the course. And uh, I, this week, want to begin to talk more specifically about discipleship in small groups. We've been looking a lot at this whole um, uh, issue of uh, you know, character development, life in Christ, uh, you know, especially with Willard's uh, teaching. And so I want to kind of develop a little bit more on the small groups this this week. Uh, next week, by the way, uh, week number six, in that message, I want to really look at um, how we do discipleship in terms of equipping people in the gifts of the Spirit. I haven't touched on that as much in this class. Uh, you know, again, as I've said in some other video teachings, it's because we get so much teaching on the gifts of the Spirit, especially in our movement uh, in Global Awakening. I wanted to really make sure we covered that other side of the coin of uh, character development and our cooperation with the Spirit to grow in grace. So, But we'll get in more into the gifts of the Spirit next week. Now, uh, before I jump in too much to the discussion on small groups, uh, let me just say this by way of intro. Uh, for my wife and I, Carolyn, uh, really, we got our start in ministry through our involvement with small groups in a church, a charismatic non-denominational church back in Florida, uh, back in the late uh, 80s and early 90s. And what had happened for us was we had kind of come out of a, a, a challenging season in our life. We were newly married and we got connected with this church and they had a large uh, home group uh, format. And um, I can't say that it was strictly transformational in terms of the emphasis of the home, home groups. There was a lot of informational uh, teaching. But what they did well was they really mixed both an element of teaching different topics as well as helping people grow in their faith and grow in relationship to Jesus. And so uh, that home group environment, I, I remember the couple well. I won't mention their names but uh, just a wonderful couple. They were about 10 years older than us and had a young family. And uh, they were just really, really great, great host and just love the Lord and uh, just really humble people. And Carolyn and I learned so much from them. And our walk with Christ began to go to a whole nother place. And it was in that small group discipleship format that gave us um, relationship, that gave us accountability that uh, helped steer us in terms of our understanding of uh, biblical teaching and, and key topics. And uh, then we began to get exposed to operating in the gifts of the Spirit, and it all began there. And so I, I just wanted to share that because I hadn't really shared with all of you just how positive I am about small groups and how valuable they are in a local church setting for, uh, for many different aspects of helping people get connected, help them uh, build a relationship with one another, grow in Christ, grow in the, in the op operation of the gifts of the Spirit. And so uh, a small group meeting really is at the backbone, I think, of uh, what the Lord intended, you know, in, in terms of uh, discipleship, uh, especially for our local churches today. So just want to touch on that. So let me, uh, we'll get back into small group here in a, in a minute. I want to cover some of the Willard uh, topics first for a few minutes. And then jump into Watson, where his in chapter five this week, uh, he begins to really look at the practical now of getting a, a small group started. Um, so uh, Willard, in his book, I believe it's chapter seven, and uh, of the Great Omission, he jumps in, and the very first thing that he mentions is uh, well, he doesn't really mention it. It's in it's in the subtitle of the chapter, Galatians 4:19. And that's where Paul says, my little children, from whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. And uh, I just wanted just to touch again on this whole thing of process and growing uh, more in, in uh, the nature of Christ. So Paul, as most of you are well aware, he's writing to the Gentile believers there in, in Galatia. And this is actually his first letter, his first epistle. They've got a problem where... Uh, the Jewish teachers, uh, commonly referred to as the Judaizers, are coming up from Jerusalem, coming into that area, and they're telling these new 
uh, Gentile converts to Christ that uh, they must also practice Jewish uh, tradition and law. And so Paul is, is writing this letter and really uh, uh, coming at them pretty strong. Listen, you know, you, you started out so well. What, what's happened? Who's bewitched you? I think in one translation it says. But notice, though, in this verse, he, he says, uh, until Christ is formed in you. In other words, the implication that Paul is clearly making to them, look, I'm praying for you that you will grow in grace and that the fullness of, of Christ that's in you will grow and that you'll be strong, you, you'll be steadfast in your, in your faith. And so once again, we see another passage of scripture, if you will, from Paul, where he uh, really does talk about this whole essence of maturing in Christ and the process of maturing uh, that can take place. And, and as well for leaders, our role to help pray and help others grow in that maturing process a little bit there. Um, another, uh, this wasn't in, in chapter seven this week with Willard, but as I was thinking about it, uh, I was contemplating about the life of Christ. And uh, Luke chapter four, let me just read this couple verses here. Uh, Luke writes, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. Then, of course, the temptation narrative there. And then in verse 14, Luke writes, uh, after now Jesus has overcome these temptations, the devil departs. Verse 14, then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went through all the surrounding region. And so uh, just before this happens for Jesus, he's baptized by John in the River Jordan. All three persons of the Trinity are, are present, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father uh, pronounces, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove. And soon thereafter, uh, the Spirit now leads Jesus into the wilderness uh, where he spends 40 days fasting, praying, communing with the Father, uh, uh, just spending time in silence, in solitude. Now, think of what you read with Willard this week in, in chapter 7, or you will read. He talks a lot about, again, these spiritual disciplines that help us grow in grace. And um, in our busy 21st century culture, um, silence and solitude is not something that we, we probably think about much. I mean, we talk about quiet time or maybe we teach our people, you know, the importance of a prayer and quiet time and communion. Um, I like to teach them also on soaking prayer, how to just wait in the presence of God. And so certainly that's an aspect of silence and solitude. But those terms aren't used very much. And uh, of course, Willard liked to use those terms. But when you look and think about the life of Jesus, what was he doing? He's led by the Spirit. So there's this whole obedience aspect. He only did what he saw the Father do. He was dependent upon the Holy Spirit for life and ministry. He goes into the wilderness. He spends time silence and solitude for 40 days. We see that he's fasting. He's praying. Again, more of these spiritual disciplines. We don't know much. It doesn't say whether, you know, there's any study of the word or anything. But we also know that Jesus did study the word. We see previous in Luke when he was just, what, about a 12-year-old? He's left there behind in Jerusalem, and he's talking with the, the religious leaders, and they're just, you know, his parents don't realize he's there. They come back, and everybody marvels at the knowledge that he has. Well, obviously, there had been some study of the word, uh, uh, you know, understanding Jewish tradition, etc. So we see these disciplines. And then later in the of course in the Gospels, we see Jesus as he interacts as teacher, rabbi, with his disciples, we see the value of the discipline of relationship and spending time with other people. So we see in the life of Jesus all of these important disciplines uh, at work as he is uh, uh, if you will, maturing more uh, into the very 
I mean, he's completely God, yet he's dependent on the spirit. But yet we still see these these spiritual practices um, that are taking place there. And of course, we know throughout the scriptures, the writer of Hebrews tells us that, you know, he was uh, like us in every way, tempted in every way, yet without sin. And uh, he learned obedience, the writer says, even through through suffering. And so there's this whole aspect of the very life of Christ being divine, yet human, yet practicing disciplines. And so if, if Jesus did it, uh, again, I just want to submit to you, that should be part of the essence of our growth as disciples, as well as how we're helping uh, and train and impart that to others. So the question I thought of, again, this passage, and so I'll just throw this out there to you, and, and you know, I think you already know the answer. Uh, it's a bit rhetorical. Did Jesus earn the power or the grace? It says at the end of that 40 days as he's overcome the temptation. It says he was led, you know, he was led by the spirit into the wilderness. Now he leaves the wilderness in the power of the spirit. So did he earn power? Did he earn more grace? Well, the answer is no. Um, again, as, as, as we've talked now uh, these last few weeks in this class, um, uh, as Willard stated, you know, God's not opposed or grace isn't opposed to, to effort, but it is opposed to earning. And of course, that ties right in with Paul's writings, uh, you know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 in particular, for by grace you've been saved through faith, not of, you know, not by yourself. It's not of works, you know. And so we don't earn anything. We don't earn salvation. We don't earn the right to operate in the gifts. It's strictly out of relationship and communion with our communion with the Lord and the empowering of the spirit and the spirit affecting uh, the gifts, the, the gifts to operate through us, as well as uh, the, the fruit of the spirit. And so Jesus didn't earn these things. Yes, he was uh, God in human flesh, but he set aside, uh, you know, certain divine you know, prerogatives that he could function on earth led by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, dependent upon the Spirit, dependent upon the Father, and so thereby giving us um, uh, a, a model of life and ministry. Of course, the well-known canonic passages, uh, you know, from Kenosis, uh, Philippians chapter 2, we're, we're talking about how that self-emptying of, uh, of Jesus. So just want to throw that out there to you. And uh, so let's just jump for a few minutes into chapter 7 here on the great omission with Willard and on page 69 uh, of this chapter 7 Willard throws out something that I think most of you are aware of and uh, you'll be answering a question this week related to this it says we've counted on preaching teaching and knowledge or information to form faith in the hearer and have counted on faith to form the inner life and outward behavior of the Christian but for whatever reason this strategy is strategy has not turned out well. The result is that we have multitudes of professing Christians who well may be ready to die, but obviously are not ready to live and can hardly get along with themselves, much less with others. Most statistical measures and anecdotal portraits of evangelical Christians, not to mention Christians in general, show a remarkable similarity in the life texture of Christians and non-Christians. And that's a sad uh, reality it, there is, really isn't much difference between many who would say they're christians and those who are non-christians and uh interestingly enough a recent poll i read uh, i think something like 73 percent of americans would say they're christian yet that number of actual committed uh followers of christ that would actually attend church the number is in the bible belt it's it's 20 percent or less uh, at best case, somewhere around that, some cities might be a little higher. Um, in most of our eastern cities or western part of the United Western cities, uh, that number is less than 10%. I know the, the city that I'm in, Tucson, Arizona, and it's very typical of many cities uh, west here. It's it's less than 10%. It's roughly about 7%. That's Catholic, mainline Protestant, and of course non-denominational churches. Less than 10%, roughly about 7% of the population attends church and so uh, you know we shouldn't be surprised then that there's a, a a big disparity between those who feel they're they're christian in the, in the church attendance and then of those small percentage that actually are attending church we shouldn't be surprised then that a lot of what's happening for many
people is a very superficial relationship with Christ and not a real devoted um, spirit-led type of uh, discipleship that certainly Jesus modeled, taught those early disciples, and then uh, encouraged us to repeat it. M much less if you take the net to the next step where that, that great commandment, uh, or the great commission rather, uh, of course, great commandment is important. We've got a foundation of love. But the, the great commission where we're going out, but in the power of the Spirit with those other, you know, other commissioning accounts being the basis. Um, so operating in the gifts of the Spirit, I, I mean, then you begin to really meditate on that and, and wonder, well, how many in our churches really are walking at such a level of, of devotion to Christ, fellowship with Christ, that not only is the character and their life has been transformed, but now they have the confidence and faith to operate and step out in the gifts of the Spirit. And you can you know, begin to see just by these percentages and things uh, how small that number must be. So our goal then has to be in churches like ours that where we believe in a full gospel, we believe in the gospel of the kingdom with signs following, and the demonstration of the kingdom through the signs, wonders, miracles, healings, etc., that, that we've got to help ignite fire in the people for a love for Jesus as well as uh, such a, a devotion to him that um, you know they want to follow him no matter what and not not the things of the world so so just touching there and uh, page 72 I jump over there for a minute um, uh, Willard asked this question he says how then are we to think about spiritual formation and again Maybe you don't like the term spiritual formation. That's fine. Uh, we might, in our circles, call it transformation, spiritual transformation or transformation of the inner man. Uh, uh, you know, in fact, there's a, a, you know, that's a very key thing. He says, how then are we to think about spiritual formation in a way that is faithful to the gospel and to the nature of that eternal life that is present in Christ and given to us with him? He said, let us begin with practices over behavior. And he jumps down and he starts talking about the Great Commission. And, uh, and his point in, in men mentioning, he says, all things whatsoever that I have commanded you. In other words, go make disciples, make people into the very image of Christ, and to the point of obedience. And that's what he's getting at here. That everything that I've taught you, now you teach them and help them get to the place where they can obey. Uh he says, of course, this assumes that we ourselves are in obedience, having learned how to obey Christ. And I can let you read down through that. And he warns against legalism, by the way, in this page 72 and 73. So I want to be careful that when we have this kind of discussion that, that you know, that you understand we're not leaning towards works. I'm not advocating works. And, and I don't believe Willard certainly was either. Uh, but we're not also afraid of process. I think we need to embrace process and realize the spirit is bringing transformation. But what we're after is that transformation that leads to this complete obedience of Christ where we follow him unreservedly, as we've talked since the beginning of this course. Now he goes on to say, uh, uh, any challenge, he goes, uh, you're wondering, are there really very many churches or places that are really teaching and challenging the people to do everything uh, that Christ had commanded us. Uh, this is, uh, it's challenging. You know, as I was meditating on this and, you know, I read this book some time ago, but as I, you know, re going over this for this class, um, it, it's, it's challenging. I, I mean, the, the, the level of commitment that Christ wants and expected his disciples to operate in and what we see presently in our church cultures is is not necessarily on the same page. And so uh, the only way that that can really happen is that there be such an inward transformation in both those of us that teach or lead or pastor churches uh, or disciple others uh, and then help those that have been discipled to understand that as, as, as well. That there is this place of freely having received from Christ letting that grace now transform us and then walking in such a place of obedience that it leads us into all other aspects, you know, fulfilling the great commission, operating in the fullness of the spirit, gifts of the spirit, etc. So, uh, 
he touches on quite a bit there. Let me just a couple other thoughts here, and I'll jump into what Watson had to share this week as well. Um, on page 73 to 75, Spiritual again, spiritual formation or transformation uh, works from the spirit, he says, or from the will, uh, and it's from its this new life that we have in Christ. Uh, but its work is not done until we have put off the old person and put on the new. Again, referencing uh, Ephesians four and Colossians three, where Paul uh, writes about this. And so again, he gets into this into this section here. On the spiritual disciplines as well that I mentioned right at the beginning of, uh, of our discussion today. Um, let me just last thought here with Willard this week, and I'll let you just go through that. You've got about three questions I think in this chapter this week to answer. And um, the quote here by by Willard is a real key on page 76. Again, right after he makes a statement, grace is opposed to earning but not to effort. He says this: the realities of Christian spiritual formation. Um, or that we will not be transformed into his likeness by more information or by, or by infusions, inspirations, or ministrations alone. Of course, last lesson in the previous chapter, we talked about sometimes even as charismatics, you know, we're just waiting for this lightning strike and all of a sudden everything's going to change. And so here he unpacks it a little more in this chapter, uh, you know, more information, more infusions, we might call it impartation. Uh, inspirations or ministrations alone. Now, again, I believe strongly in the power of impartation, and it is true. I've seen many people uh, receive an impartation, and they are dramatically changed. You know, now this empowering of the Spirit that's come through the impartation causes this acceleration of their devotion to Christ, their love for Jesus, uh, not just maybe operating in, in some of the gifts, but uh, there can be a dramatic change. So I don't want to I don't completely agree with Willard uh, on this, but I understand, I think, where he's coming from. And, and that is, let's not throw out process also. Let's understand that part of our maturing and part of our discipleship isn't just going to be on more you know, information and more classes we sit through or just another great set of meetings we, we attended. You know, there's got to be uh, you know, some, some depth here. Uh, again, so uh, I'm not against impartation, very much for it, very much for these lightning strikes that can happen by the Spirit. And I've had a couple of those in my life, too, and it just accelerates you in another place in God and these uh, these encounters that we have in God that leads us deeper in relationship. But uh, we also want to, to allow the process to unfold of maturing as well. He says, though all of these have an important place, they never suffice, and reliance upon them alone explains the now common failure of committed Christians to rise much above a certain level of decency. And uh, from those, and when I read this, I, I'll just throw this one out, and this is not to offend anybody from a Assemblies of God background, but I've met numerous folks that uh, maybe from an AOG background that have had experiences, you know, with tongues and, uh, uh, you know, maybe some level of the gifts of the Spirit, but, but in many cases, you know, they, they had an experience, they began to speak in tongues, and yet they never really progress much beyond that. You don't see, in some cases, I've even observed very little fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, you know, kindness towards other people, uh, much less maybe the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. So, uh, again, uh, you know, sometimes even committed Christians who love the Lord, they dutifully serve in churches and different ministries and churches, they can be stuck or plateaued because they haven't really had a true... Uh, ongoing transformational experience in the Lord where they're, they're being changed from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18, where there's this ongoing transformation that's taking place. Again, that doesn't mean we're always looking for some hidden sin, but we allowing the spirit of grace at work in us uh, to, to change and make us more and more like into the image of Jesus and operating uh, more from that place. So I'll leave you with that with Willard. Uh, let's get into small small groups a little bit. So Watson, let me grab his book here, beginning to uh, talk in chapter 5. He calls it the basics from start to finish. And he says here on page 77, the rest of the book discusses how to actually start class meetings. And so his version of modern day reenacting uh, sort of a Wesleyan class meeting type, type format. Now, uh, uh, I don't, 
I hope you understand I'm not advocating that we uh, become purely Wesleyan or that we try to exactly reenact a class meeting. And I don't necessarily even fully agree with everything that, that Watson's saying here. Part of the reason I chose this book, though, is number one, we see with Wesley such a committed discipler and an understanding of how to really help bring people into uh, a discipleship experience where they grow in grace and, and they stay steadfast in the Lord. So that, that was important historically. And then in terms historically, then also understanding how they did class meeting. Now, Watson's thesis, then we need to come back to this transformational type small group relational meetings. I do agree with that. Uh, trying to maybe do exactly, you know, his model, I, I'm not so sure. But again, it's it's a it gives us lots to think about versus maybe just curriculum based type discipleship or information type discipleship groups. Now, so one of the things he touches on, and I do definitely agree with this, uh, he says, for example, uh, great expectations. So he, he he sort of just throws it out there. Listen, don't don't let perfect be the enemy of good. In other words, you can have great expectations for small groups, but you're never probably and any of you that have pastored or done small groups for a while, you know what I'm talking about. You, you never maybe get it just right. You know, you're always trying to trying to tweak how you're doing it and how the, the leaders are, are doing with it. Uh, but that said, I think we can still uh, maybe go to another level in, in discipleship and uh, developing more in others. Now, uh, over on page 81, he talks about starting somewhere. And he suggests, for example that if you're getting ready to start small groups in a church, so here's food for thought for some of you who are either pastors, future pastors, leaders, or maybe you'll be involved in helping small groups get going in your church uh, or in the future, uh, that maybe the senior pastor would introduce to the congregation uh, a sermon series about class meeting or the value of small groups and, uh, and really focus on the method of the small groups and what the what the focus is then he's suggesting maybe the end of the sermon series uh you know and if the pastor is generally committed to this then to begin to look for spiritual leaders that could help lead the class meeting or again small groups whatever you may call them um that type of thing he also makes this statement which is important he said the most gifted and spiritually mature in the church should be asked to lead a class meeting before they are asked to do anything else. In other words, sometimes what happens, the ones that are most pastoral, and that's sort of a whole nother subject. Uh, uh, you have a lot of folks that are very pastoral. Maybe they're not ever going to be the senior pastor. And by the way, the senior pastor, oftentimes they're more apostolic, prophetic, or teacher, whatever. But you have oftentimes many people who are carry a pastor's anointing, but they're, that anointing is for that small groups. And so they're very gifted at it, but if they're not given an opportunity and they're and they're just, you know, pushed into just teaching curriculum all the time or, you know, sitting on church boards, you, you know, he mentions that type of thing, then some of the best gifting that they have or what the church can glean from is not really uh, tapped into. And so he mentions all that. So warming your congregation up to the whole idea of small groups, getting their buy-in, so to speak telling the purpose of the small groups, looking for leaders that you can train up, raise, that can lead small groups uh, are very important. Then he gives this example of Bishop Wills and uh, Christ Church. And uh, by the end of it, I think over here, uh, I forget what page it's on, where they are eventually have like 170 uh, small groups by, by the time I think he, he left there. And uh, they were very... Uh, is very very successful in in uh, you know what what took place there and 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 how that went. Well, let me just check my notes here a second. And so, um, okay, so this is what I want to remember. He said one of the key phrases that he said it's important to begin to. Oh, it's back on page eighty where he talked about Christ Church and 170 groups. But he goes on to say he says so referencing that church or any church that would really develop a lot of small groups. And that's the core. He says, and the church began to function more as a church of small groups rather than a church with small groups. Now that statement really struck me because back in the early nineties, when the cell church movement really was a, a big push in our country, 
the United States, uh, you know, that was a big emphasis. Trying to get a cell church model going or a small group model going, uh, and that was something that they, they would say. You know, you, you don't want to be a church, uh, you know, that has small groups or cells. You want to be a church where it's all about the small groups. That's the essence of the church, you know. And, and so you may need to look at different types of programs that you have an operation. Some of those may need to go by the wayside so that you can become more intentional to be relational so that people can really be in these small groups where there's greater accountability, greater opportunities to grow, greater opportunities to begin to learn how to move in the gifts of the Spirit. I actually personally believe one of the best ways for people to learn how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, uh, a seminar is great. Global Awakening does an excellent job, you know, going to a seminar. Uh, you can learn a lot. That's great. But for ongoing long-term type of application would be some type of small group discipleship setting where you're comfortable, you know one another, maybe eight to 12 people, that type of thing. You begin to practice, you know, how to get words of knowledge, how to pray for the sick, how to give a prophecy, that type of thing. And, uh, and everybody's teachable, accountable. You know, it's a safe place to give a word, receive a word, safe place to give ministry, receive ministry, safe place to receive a little bit of adjustment if somebody's off, you know. So I personally think it's a, it's a great way to really help people grow in the gifts of the Spirit uh, it, more better. I mean, I've, I've done numerous classes over the years where I teach people how to operate in the different gifts of the Spirit, and, and that's good. People always love those, but I always try to do some activation exercise. But long term, I think in the small group setting, it's it's best. So, uh, again, the cell church format had the same mindset. Now, I uploaded a PDF a couple of weeks ago of the sort of small group model, which was sort of based off of a cell model that I learned back in the early 90s that I've done and had different at different times in our church at different levels of success with it. And uh, so I throw that out there because one of your assignments here the next uh, week or two, you're going to be writing an outline for how to how to do uh, how to implement small group uh, in a church setting and then writing a paper on how to do uh, small groups in a church setting. And so you may want to take a look at that. You may want to look at some other resources. Certainly Watson's book will give you an idea as well. But it, again, there is no perfect model. You, every church culture, every city, every different season, you know, the different age groups within your church, you have to just really pray and, and get the heart of where the Lord is at and, and how the Lord would have you to move on that. And so the last thing that Watson talks about, and you're going to answer a question, I think, this week on this. He talks about the life cycle with the small groups, the birthing of it, uh, establishing a routine, refining the purpose, and then maturity. And so that's pretty uh, self-explanatory and I'm going to just kind of close with this and he mentioned some of this some of the challenges with implementing the small groups in the church one one of the initial challenges might be they tend to be more homogeneous in other words uh, depending on that leader that's leading a particular group they may go and recruit or they attract uh, with their gift mix uh, a certain type of people and so uh, you know, again, not that they're trying to be exclusive of others, uh, or, you know, but, but you know, if you've got somebody that's really strong prophetic, let's say, and so they've got a group that they're leading. So what may naturally happen is a lot of the prophetic people, they all want to be part of that group, you know, type of thing. Uh, for example, if you've got someone that's more pastoral, they really have a heart, let's say, anointed in inner healing, helping people come out of a place of brokenness, get made whole. All of a sudden, you might find folks that are you know, kind of hurting and going through all of a sudden they kind of end up over there, you know, a couple of examples. And so, um, so one of the challenges then with small groups, trying to implement a small group structure in the church is trying to make it really uh, open and relevant to, to a large group of people, different backgrounds and diverse. Uh, and now here's another challenge and he doesn't mention this, but I've experienced this on more than one occasion with small groups in our church. Um, Leaders themselves go through changes. For example, I had one season a few years ago where some of my best leaders, in fact, they were both elders, uh, them and their wives, uh, in our church, and uh, great leaders. I mean, both husband and wife teams, powerful. Uh, all of them, you know, experienced as elders, uh, you know, pastoral anointing on them. They were great leading small groups, great teaching classes, etc. Really good. Well, in a span of about a year, both of them got job transfers 
had to move out of the city, you know, leave our church. It was a, you know, we were happy for them. We knew it was the Lord. They knew it was a, you know, we all were teary eyed, you know, you know, friendships are always hard when these things. And and so there was nothing bad. It was, it was just a, it was a season we went through where they transferred. Well, that affected those two leaders. And even though we had about six other small groups that were really working pretty well, those two were anchor leaders, if you will, in the small church uh, or in the small groups that we had in the church. And so when they left, there was like a, a big hole. Soon after they left, right about the same time, I had another uh, leader who, um, actually two leaders, uh, leave the church rather abruptly. Uh, the one leader was a former pastor. Him and his wife had, you know, wanted to, to close down their church. It had dwindled down to about 30 members. They were almost 70 years old. They lived about uh, 45 minutes from we, we, where we are here in Tucson. They wanted to come up, be a part, help minister and teach and different things. And it came for a while and, and it worked well for a while. And then, um, well, they, they got offended, just got offended about something. And it happens in church. And next thing you know, they're upset. They're going to leave. Well, they affected a few people. We had a little church split. Well, he affected another one of my leaders and small group leaders. And that uh, brother and his wife, they got offended and they all left at the same time. So in a span of about a year, I had two really good sets of leaders move, get job transfers, move. And then I went through this situation with these other leaders, uh, got offended, and their their offense kind of fed off of one another. They left. It created uh, a, a, another hole, left a bunch of people really confused. In fact, the one the one group, uh, any everybody that was part of the the, the one group with that one set of leaders. Uh, the offense was so deep that that everybody who was part of that group ended up leaving the church. It was really a sad thing. And most of those, some of those people never really got connected to a church elsewhere in town, bounced around two, three different churches. Um, it, you know, you see these kind of things. So it's sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly with, with small groups. While uh, we've tried to really hit on the positive through this course and how valuable and needed they are, part of the challenge is one of the biggest challenge uh, as a pastor and uh, if you're not a pastor, but you're working with your pastor and you're trying to help them uh, or encourage them to get small groups going, this is the dynamic that that many pastors have experienced where getting the right leaders that are really loyal to the vision of the church, committed to the church. They're not trying to just uh, grow a group uh, so they can get their own following, their own uh, uh, you know ministry. Um, that's an important thing. And so it's something that needs to really be prayed over very carefully. And it's a it's a it's a big dynamic to overcome in our churches. I remember uh, just before I first started small groups in our church back when we first, after we first planted the church, I remember talking to another church, uh, another pastor from out of state that I knew really well, and uh, he said to me, he goes, "I stopped doing small groups years ago." He goes, "I had too many situations with too many leaders that uh, you know they would pull people away, then we'd have a church split or whatever." And he was resolute. He just did a Wednesday night service and that was it. He didn't do small groups. And so here's my advice. We don't want to throw the proverbial baby out with the, the bathwater. I think small groups and relationship uh, mentoring is what Jesus modeled, what Jesus intended, but it does come with risk. And so we have to be willing to navigate the risk, to work with people, identify the right leaders, help them get uh, trained up and set in place, and then give them some some oversight what what i find that works good to help prevent some of these leadership issues when they're leading their own group like that is to have some touch time with them and really that's in the cell church model that's sort of what is advocated uh in the cell church model you know you'd have your group of 12 maybe your wife would have her group of 12 and uh then they would have maybe their group of 12 if your church is large enough etc and so you'd meet with them once a week. They would meet with their groups once a week. The other groups would meet then on down the line once a week for like an hour each time. And so there's some relationship accountability weekly with your leaders. And then they're meeting with their people and their leaders. And so it, it creates that. Um, that's really good. But as I mentioned a couple of teachings ago, the challenge with the uh, cell church model, and it never really took off that well here in the United States, it's done great down in Latin America, um, parts of Latin America, 
is that it tends to be for, for Americans, it just seems that, that we like our independence. We like to kind of come and go. People are hesitant to commit time-wise, et cetera. Uh, it, it just seems to be really, really hard to get people to commit to a more uh, stronger discipleship type format. And, and that's way beyond, and that's not even getting into the issue of asking people in a group very intimately, you know, how are you doing? How's your walk with Christ? Uh, you, you know, again, i.e., how is it with your soul, as Wesley would have them ask. Uh, so irrespective, not even getting to that place, just trying to get people to where they'll commit to some time to a small group discipleship, it's a big challenge that we as pastors and churches in America today are facing. Again, it goes back to the demographics and some of the statistics that we're dealing with. The level of commitment of, of uh, Christians uh, in most of our churches is is not what it used to be. Um, you know, you, you look back over the last 50 years, let's say, in American church culture, you know, we've, we've gone from where people would meet like on Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, uh, maybe they, you know, they even go out and do evangelism on Thursday night or something like that, to now what sim seems to be the, the trend. If, if people will come, uh, you know, one sun Sunday or Saturday night service a week and maybe one other night a week, that you're doing really well. And that's not even the norm. Um, you know, it's more norm to see most of our people where they come, you know, once or twice on a Sunday a month, once or twice on a Saturday night or whatever, if you've got a Saturday night service. And uh, that's about it for most people. So so one of the big hurdles then, trying to, to instill a value in our churches with our people of getting in these small groups, that's another uh, obstacle that, that uh, you know, we've got to, by the Spirit's leading, try to solve. So, so as you're working on your assignments the next couple of weeks, thinking about that, pray through that, think through that, because it, it it's really an important piece, uh, you know, that we need to do. Now, like I know in my class, if I, in my church, if I, if I announce on a Sunday morning, uh, starting October 15th, we're going to do an eight week uh, series on Wednesday night. One of our classes we'll be teaching is on, uh, uh, you know, financial prosperity or financial stewardship. I'll have a good turnout. People want to know how to do better. You know, it's information driven. It's curriculum driven. They want to they want to know how to to you know. Or if I advertise a marriage class, I'll get some couples. They want to go. They want to improve their marriage. You know, it's popular. If I mentioned um, spiritual gifts class, we're going to you know teach on healing ministry, how to get words of knowledge, etc. Usually, I have a pretty good turnout with that. If I uh, if I announce the two things that if I announce, uh, one we're going to do prayer on such and such night. Uh, Usually not such a great turnout on that. And then the other one is, okay, we're going to develop small groups to, to build relationship, accountability, et cetera, et cetera. Don't seem to get the interest anymore. And so it's it's a challenge. And I don't think I'm, I'm the only pastor that's experienced that. So I think I'm going to leave you there. Oh, uh, two, other, two other challenges then with this also is geographic. Now, uh, like in a metropolitan area, uh, what happens is, like our church, we attract people from like a one-hour radius around the church. Well, that one-hour drive, if you're in a metropolitan area, that's that's challenging. You get through traffic, they, they, they feel identified with our DNA and who we are as a church. They want to be a part, but now trying to get them out to, to another uh, meeting through the week, even if it's a class that they're interested in, uh, you, know, or, you know, or discipleship, small group. Um, it's a challenge, you know, to, to, to just the drive time. So geographic can be an issue. Uh, if you develop small groups where, where leaders now have the meetings in their home, let's say, and so it's geographically based, sometimes that can uh, help eliminate some of that geographic uh, challenge. But then it gets into another area of challenge, and that is the issue of child care. Most small group discipleship you always hit that hurdle. Well, what about the children? You're trying to attract families, young couples, get them there. And uh, someone's got to watch the children. And so I've seen it done where, uh, you know, everything from another room in the house is used and maybe a, a teenager uh, can watch the kids or one of the parents watches the kids and they rotate. Uh, or uh, I even saw one time at church that everybody would drop the children off at the church. They paid for some child care workers to watch the children, then everybody went then to these small groups in different homes. The downside to that is, is then you run into the geographic problem again. Everybody's gonna meet at the church and do that. 
Um, another way that sometimes I've seen people do it, especially if there's a leader and maybe somebody else is part of the group and they live close to one another, maybe the children are dropped off at the other house and you've got one and you rotate one of the sets of parents is watching the children that week there and then uh, you know at the other meeting. So again, these are all things that to consider. And so as you're going through this the next couple of weeks, uh, thinking about this, uh, again, I can't stress enough, I really think small group discipleship is very much needed in our churches. Trying to overcome some of these obstacles are very real. And, uh, but if you can you know, do it, I think it's, it's well uh, worth it and really add something to the life of the church and the community. So that's it for this week. Uh, you guys are doing great, and um, we'll uh, talk to you next week.